Hello everybody, this is Dr. Christopher White. Welcome back for part 3 of Mesozoic Life History Part 2. So before we go any further, let's just get the code word out of the way. The code word is Triceratops. I repeat, Triceratops. That's T-R-I-C-E-R-A-T-O-P-S. Triceratops. So please make sure you write that down and put it somewhere safe because you'll need it for the code word quiz. So at the end of the previous presentation, we've been looking at the evolution of the mammals from the cynodonts. So now let's spend a few slides just having a quick look at some of the mammals which were present as part of the Mesozoic community. So on the whole, Mesozoic mammals would have been quite small, so they would have often been the size of mice and rats. So they typically wouldn't have exceeded a size of about 15 centimetres. And this is because, you know, a lot of the mammals we're talking about here would have been being actively hunted by larger predators, mostly dinosaurs. So obviously being small and being able to hide is an evolutionary advantage in that situation. Now, there are a couple of exceptions to this rule, and both of these are from China. So the first exception is an unnamed Middle Jurassic aquatic mammal, which measured 50 centimetres long, and it's of interest to us because it has the oldest known fossilised fur. So the reason this particular organism probably managed to meet, um, reach this large size is very likely because it's operating in the aquatic environment. And this means competition with other groups of animals like the dinosaurs and reptiles in general would probably have been lower. And this would have allowed it to have, you know, become a major predator within this particular environment. So that would have helped it to allow it to reach its larger size. Now, the other organism is an organism called Repinomamus. And this is an early Cretaceous one metre long carnivore that weighed about 12 to 14 kilograms. So this was a, a very sizable animal. Now, this one is of interest to us because one of the fossils that we found of this particular organism has its stomach contents fossilized. And as part of that stomach contents, we can see that it contains the bones of at least one juvenile dinosaur. So it should be remembered that these primitive mammals still retained reptilian features and that the kinds of mammalian features that we used to now, like the free-boned inner ear, the differentiated teeth, etc., were in the process of developing via mosaic evolution. And so this means that, yes, these organisms would have looked like mammals to us, but there would also have been subtle traits which would have hinted at their reptilian lineage. So here we actually have the uh, the fossil of the uh, Repinomamus uh, organism in question. So we can see uh, the head would have been located up here at the top and the tail would have been down at the bottom. We can see the spinal column coming straight down there. We can see one forelimb here, another forelimb here. Obviously the rib cage is there. Pelvis is down here. And right here you can see a collection of smaller bones and bone fragments. And this is actually the picture of it blown up, and this is a map of the uh, the bones in this area. So we can obviously see we have the spinal column of the Repinomamus right there. And then we have this collection of bones right here. And as part of this collection of bones, we can see we have the hind limb of a dinosaur here in red, the phalanges of a dinosaur in green, and the phalanges are finger and toe bones, the forelimb of a dinosaur in blue, and the teeth of a dinosaur in purple. And these bones show indications of having been essentially chewed, so we can see teeth marks in them, and we can even see some indications of acid damage. And so this is showing us that, you know, this is clearly a prey item that's, you know, in the stomach. So this is showing us that, you know, this particular large mammal was an active hunter and as part of its diet, it went after small dinosaurs. And just to give you some idea of the size of Repinomamus, uh, here's a picture of it compared to a modern day possum. So when we look at the fossil record, we can see that mammals were present in the Mesozoic by the late Triassic. And these mammals would later diverge into two distinct groups. So the first group are the monotremes. So these are the egg-laying mammals, and this is a group that includes the spiny anteater and the platypus. Now, in terms of the divergence of this group from the main mammalian line, it looks like it probably happened sometime before the Middle Jurassic. We're not 100% sure when. Now, the other group are the Therians, and this is a group of mammals which give birth to live young. So essentially, this is every other mammal with the exception of the monotremes. Uh, 
So um, this group contains two important subgroups, the marsupials and the placental mammals. So the marsupials are the pouch mammals, so that's organisms that include kangaroos, koalas and wombats, and the placental mammals is a group essentially that contains the other remaining mammals. So that's groups like the rodents, the humans, the bears, the whales, the cats, the dogs, etc. Now, as I said, we're uncertain when the monotremes diverge from the mammalian line. However, we do have some general timing evidence for this divergence in the form of a 160 million year old fossil from China called Jeremiah. Now, Jeremiah is a placental mammal. And so this would indicate the divergence of the marsupials and the placental mammals sometime around the Middle Jurassic. Now, this obviously means the monotremes must therefore have diverged from the mammalian line before the Middle Jurassic, because, of course, the placental mammals are part of the Therian group. So we know in order for the Therian group to have existed, the monotremes must have branched off earlier. Now, fossils of placental mammals indicate that the line was well established by the early Cretaceous. So now we're going to spend some time thinking about how the breakup of Pangaea and the movement of the continents towards their current position ended up affecting life in the Mesozoic. So we are going to spend some time looking at Mesozoic paleobiogeography, which is quite the mouthful. So the construction and fragmentation of Pangaea has significant effects on the habitats that formed and therefore the distribution of certain animals, as you would expect. So for much of the Mesozoic, the global climate was on the whole quite equitable and the transition from the equator to the higher latitudes was not that strong. So warm conditions continued towards the poles for quite a long way. And so this would have made the environment quite nice and quite you know, hospitable to most organisms. Now, there would have been some local variation caused by regional factors such as mountain ranges, but on the whole conditions would have been quite nice. Now, this rather you know, nice climate allowed plants and animals to occupy more extensive geographical ranges, particularly in coastal areas where there was lots of water available. And so what you have is you have a situation where you have nice conditions. Obviously, that's going to help plants to be able to grow pretty much anywhere. And as long as the conditions are met, such as a reasonable amount of water, the plants will inhabit that area and they will typically prosper. So the Triassic period was on the whole tropical, with mild temperatures extending 50 degrees north and south of the equator. So this means, you know, you have a very, very broad, warm band around the midpoint of the Earth that extends 50 degrees from that equator. So that's a very large area of the Earth's surface uh, where conditions would have been quite nice. Now, as Pangaea was still together in the Triassic, we see that dinosaurs and plants from this period have a near global distribution. And of course, this makes quite a lot of sense because the continents are all joined together. It would have been relatively easy for animals to have migrated from one landmass to another. Now, as we move from the Triassic into the Jurassic, we see that the mild climate continues. Although, of course, by this point, Pangaea has broken up into two large landmasses. We have Laurasia in the Northern Hemisphere, so that's North America, Europe, and Asia. And we have Gondwana in the Southern Hemisphere, that's South America, Africa, India, Australia, and Antarctica. Now, in terms of the uh, nice uh, climatic band, which we saw in the Triassic, this nice band persists into the Jurassic, and it actually gets a little bit wider. And so in the Jurassic, we can see that we have tropical ferns growing as far north as 63 degrees from the equator. Just to give you some idea, 60 degrees north of the equator is equivalent to the southern tip of Greenland. And so this means that during the Jurassic, there was a very broad uh, climatic band, which essentially, uh, essentially, went, essentially went all the way around the Earth. And within this band, conditions were very, very good. Obviously, you had nice warm weather. As long as you had enough rainwater and good enough soil, this obviously would have allowed plant life to flourish. And so that would mean there would be plenty of food for large herbivores, especially the dinosaurs. 
Now, by the late Jurassic, we see that uh, Eurasia and North America are beginning to separate. Now, to be clear, the separation of North America and Eurasia takes a very long time, and we don't see the two land masses actually fully separating from one another until the very, very end of the Cretaceous. So what I'm saying here is we see the first signs of North America beginning to rift away from Eurasia in the Jurassic, but we don't actually see the two land masses become independent from each other until the end of the Cretaceous. So this means that during the Jurassic and for much of the Cretaceous, it would have been possible for animals to have migrated from North America into Europe and into Asia and vice versa. In terms of what's going on down in the southern hemisphere, we obviously have the breakup of Gondwana. So we have South America and Africa rift off another landmass, which is made from India, Australia and Antarctica. And then by the middle Jurassic, we begin to see the first stages of South America rifting away from Africa. Now, the breakup of Pangaea begins to explain some of the factors which we see in the distribution of certain groups of dinosaurs. So a good example are the Stegosaurian dinosaurs. So we see that they are exclusively limited to North America, Europe and Asia. And of course this makes sense because during the, during the Jurassic, North America, Europe and Asia formed one large landmass. So the Stegosaurs could have obviously migrated across, you know, with relatively little fuss. In contrast, the southern hemisphere continents were completely separated from the northern hemisphere continents by a large body of water and so this would have therefore made it impossible for the stegosaurs to have ever made it onto the southern hemisphere continents so they're just not present in the fossil record of those land masses. So by the Cretaceous we see that South America, Africa, India and North America are operating as discrete continents, although Europe and Asia stay together as one landmass and Australia is still joined to Antarctica for a very large portion of the Cretaceous. So because the, climate, because the continents are moving towards their current positions, we begin to see strongly defined climatic zones beginning to develop. And within those climatic zones, we also see the formation of seasonal variation. So we've already discussed that the movement of the continents is going to affect the circulation of water in the oceans and air in the atmosphere. And this is obviously going to have an effect on climate. We've also discussed how the movement of continental crust northwards and southwards towards the North and South Pole essentially replaces seawater, which is present, which was present, should I say, at the poles in quite large quantities during the Triassic and Jurassic with continental crust. The problem is, is that seawater is very, very effective at absorbing and retaining solar radiation. So it helps to keep the area warm. In contrast, continental crust is far worse at absorbing and retaining uh, solar radiation, so it doesn't retain as much heat. And so this means as Antarctica moves towards the South Pole, and as North America, Europe and Asia move towards the North Pole, we are essentially replacing seawater, which is very good at absorbing heat, with continental crust, which is pretty rubbish at absorbing continental heat, uh, solar heat. And so this means that we begin to see a temperature decrease in the polar regions. So as we move into the Cretaceous, things are getting a little bit more variable, shall we say. Now, during the Cretaceous, we get to see some of the largest variation in fauna and flora during the Mesozoic. And this is because we are setting up these localized environments in which evolution will have to specialize the animals. So these isolated populations for each of these different continents uh, produce several interesting trends. So in the case of Australia, we see that the marsupials arrive in Australia via Antarctica, but very few placental mammals make it to Australia. And so this means that in terms of the makeup in, with regard to mammals of, of Australia, we see that it's dominated by the marsupials and placental mammals are a relatively minor component.
Now, this actually also held true for South America. For a very long period of time, South America's mammal population was also dominated by the marsupials. However, what we saw is we saw the marsupial population population being hit quite hard when North and, when North and South America joined together because this then allows the placental mammals of North America to move south and they begin to outcompete the marsupials of South America pretty effectively. So we also see that the Middle and Late Cretaceous climate of South America was perfect for the sauropods. So when we're talking about the rest of the world during the Cretaceous, so North America, Europe, Africa, etc., conditions are getting quite hard for the sauropods. And so we begin to see sauropod populations dropping off and we begin to see you know, numerous sauropod species becoming extinct. Now, this doesn't happen in South America because conditions are absolutely perfect for the sauropods. And so what we see in South America during the Cretaceous is we see the evolution of the largest of the sauropods, the titanosauriforms. And so these titanosauriforms, these absolutely huge herbivores, of course, get uh, preyed on by predators. And so as the herbivores get larger, so must the predators. And so we also see in South America during the Cretaceous, we see the evolution of absolutely massive carnivorous dinosaurs. So that's organisms like Gigantosaurus, because there's this arms race between the uh, titanosauriforms and these very, very large predators. Now, in terms of the titanosauriforms, there's some evidence to suggest that some of them might have actually made it all the way to Australia. So that would have meant they would have had to have they would have had to have migrated from South America to Australia via Antarctica. And of course, that's possible because for a relatively long period, uh, South America, Antarctica, and Australia would have been joined together as one landmass. Now, South America did not receive many mammals. So once the dinosaurs were gone, so we're talking, you know, in the early Cenozoic, we actually see the uh, birds becoming the apex predators in South America. And this actually leads to the evolution of the three meter high flightless terror birds, as they're called. And these birds did very, very well once again until North and South America become one large become one large landmass. At that point, placental mammals from North America migrate southwards, and they end up outcompeting the uh, the flightless birds quite quickly. Now, we'll actually cover this process as part of the Cenozoic Life History Lecture. So let's talk about the end of the Cretaceous, and also obviously that means the end of the dinosaurs. So the Cretaceous tertiary boundary, which is sometimes referred to as the KT boundary, marks an extinction event. Now, this extinction event was not only devastating for the dinosaurs and the pterosaurs, but it also did some pretty serious damage to marine invertebrate communities. So we see the ammonites and we see the rudists and we see lots of different types of plankton, so single celled photosynthesizing organisms dying out at the end of the Cretaceous. Now, the reason for this mass extinction was debated for some time. For a while, we thought the Cretaceous tertiary mass extinction was due to the Deccan Traps flood basalt eruptions, which were taking place in what is now modern day India. So in, in that area during the Cretaceous, we have huge fissure eruptions pouring out vast quantities of magma onto the surface of the earth. And the model went that the, uh, the carbon dioxide that was being pumped into the atmosphere ended up, you know, causing a greenhouse effect combine that with all the other gases so like hydrogen sulfide chlorine gases fluorine gases entering the atmosphere that would eventually lead to the formation of things like acid rain which might affect soil ph or seawater ph whilst the chlorine and fluorine would enter the atmosphere and that would obviously affect the ozone layer and so that might lead to increased amounts of ultraviolet radiation making it to the surface of the earth and so you can see how the Deccan Traps, you know, has the capacity at least to lead to a mass extinction. But it was never quite large enough. It was always a little bit difficult to explain how, you know, granted a very large volcanic eruption was capable of causing a global and very, very uh, powerful mass extinction event. So it, it didn't quite work. It was a good enough argument, but it, it just seemed a little bit small compared to the actual total size of the Cretaceous tertiary mass extinction. Now, this changed in 1980. 
So in 1980, a 2.5 centimetre thick clay layer uh, at the Cretaceous tertiary boundary was analysed and it was found to be extremely rich in an element called iridium. So just to give you some idea, this here is actually the, uh, the layer of clay that was sampled. So you can see it's a clay layer that's running through here. There are limestones below it and limestones above it. And you can actually see there are some circles drilled into the rock here. This is where rock samples have been taken for analysis. And so what some scientists were doing is they were just simply taking rock samples through this sequence and they were analysing them because they were trying to come up with a new dating method for dating sedimentary rocks. And it just so happened that one of the elements they were using to try and date the sedimentary rocks was iridium. Now, iridium is a very, very rare element. So because it's highly sidrophile, that means iron-loving, when the Earth went and formed its iron core, nearly all of the iridium that was present in the early Earth went and sequestered itself in the Earth's core. And so this means that the Earth's mantle and the Earth's crust is very, very iridium poor. So just to give you some idea, the average iridium concentration in the Earth's crust is 500 parts per trillion. So that's a very, very low concentration. So the fact that we see this sudden increase in iridium in this clay layer here is extremely interesting to geologists. So the question then becomes is, right, well, where do we find large quantities of iridium? Well, you can find them in certain types of mineral deposit. However, this clay layer is absolutely nothing to do with, uh, with, with the formation of ores. So it's nothing to do with that process. The only other place where we find iridium in large concentrations is asteroids. So as soon as you see this iridium anomaly, and as soon as you think, well, what could cause it? Well, asteroid is the only logical answer. Well, then all of a sudden you begin to think, well, maybe the Cretaceous tertiary mass extinction is due to some kind of impact event. Now, once you have that idea, then you can go and look at the other evidence and you can see, right, does an impact event match with the evidence that I'm seeing? So obviously an impact event would be consistent with the iridium anomaly. The asteroid that would hit the Earth would have contained quite large quantities of iridium when compared to the concentration in the Earth's crust. And so when the, irid when the asteroid hit the surface of the Earth, obviously the asteroid would have been mostly destroyed. That would have thrown huge amounts of dust into the air and mixed in with that dust would have been pieces of the asteroid. And that dust would essentially have fallen across the entire surface of the Earth. And, the, and essentially this dust, this ejector layer, would then go to form this clay horizon, which we can see here and here. Another thing that we see is that we see that the iridium isotopes present in this clay layer are a little bit off. So the iridium isotope ratio that we see for the Earth is going to be different to the iridium isotope ratio that we get for things like asteroids. And so when we look at the iridium isotopes present in this clay layer, we see that they are most closely related to the type of ratios which we would expect to find associated with asteroids. Now, another thing that we see is that we see in the rocks uh, associated with the impact and as part of the clay layer, we have pieces of quartz which show a very, very distinctive texture called shocked quartz. You can actually see a picture of it right here. So here's a quartz crystal down a microscope and you can see that it has all of these parallel lines. And these parallel lines are the result of essentially a pressure wave passing through the crystal, compressing it and deforming its internal structure, leading to the formation of these what are called shock lamellae within the crystal. Now, there are only two ways in which you get shocked quartz. The first one is a nuclear explosion. And to the best of my knowledge, the dinosaurs did not have nuclear weapons. The other way that we can get shocked quartz is as part of a meteorite impact. And so, you know, once again, meteorite impact is obviously going to produce an event which has very, very high pressures, very, very high temperatures. And this is going to lead to the formation of shocked quartz. An impact would also go some way to explaining the soot layer. So if we just go back to the previous slide, you'll notice that above the clay layer right here, you can see you have this thick black band. And this thick black band is full of organic material and it appears to be mostly made up of, of burnt plant material. 
So the question is, is, well, how did we end up with this big, thick layer of burnt material? And the chance is, is that the material may well represent large scale forest fires associated with the impact event. Now, this point is argued over to some degree, so I'm just going to tell you that for, for honesty's sake. But, uh, but the soot layer, in theory, could be tied in to an impact event. And the final thing that we see is as part of the uh, part of the uh, late Cretaceous sequence of rocks in some areas, we see the formation of massive tsunami deposits. So we see sedimentary rocks associated with tsunamis, and the uh, sedimentary rocks we're seeing for the end of the uh, Cretaceous tertiary period, well, the, uh, at the Cretaceous tertiary boundary, should I say, show in some areas these huge thick tsunami sequences which show there must have been a very very large tsunami event and once again this would be consistent with an asteroid if the asteroid landed in the oceans or at least on the coast so just to give you some idea about just how powerful but just how big should i say this iridium anomaly is if we look at the graph here you can see this these are the standard ranges for iridium within the limestones below and above the clay layer and you'll notice that as you hit the clay layer which marks the cretaceous tertiary boundary you have this huge spike in iridium concentrations so you're going from a, about half a part per billion uh, iridium over here to over three and a half parts per billion iridium over here. That's quite a substantial increase. So once you realize that an asteroid is the most likely cause of the uh, of the Cretaceous tertiary mass extinction, you can begin to you know think about well how big would the asteroid have had to have been to cause the level of destruction that we see. And our calculations suggest that the asteroid in question would have probably been about 10 kilometers in diameter, and it would have produced a crater that was 180 kilometers in diameter and about 20 kilometers deep. So this is obviously a very big hole in the ground. Now, the formation of this crater will have displaced about 200,000 cubic kilometers of rock and sediment. And a lot of this rock and sediment would either have been instantly vaporized by the by the impact, or it would have been turned into very, very fine dust that would have been thrown up into the atmosphere. This fine dust is referred to as ejector because it's getting ejected from the impact crater. So this dust would have gone, gone up into the atmosphere and it would have done a couple of things. Number one, the dust would have blocked out the sun because the dust in the air is going to stop sunlight making it to the surface of the earth. This is obviously going to have an effect on photosynthesizing organisms, and of course it's going to lead to their eventual demise. So the other thing that we see is that as the dust falls out of the atmosphere, it's going to lead to the formation of an ejector layer, which we see as the clay horizon, this clay layer right here. So the next question is, is well, where is the impact crater? And we're very, very lucky in that we managed to find the impact crater. It's located on uh, Chicxulub, which is part of the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico. Now, the crater itself was actually found accidentally during an oil survey. But once they had found it, they started taking samples and they identified the crater and they managed to date it to 65 to 66 million years ago, which is exactly on the Cretaceous tertiary boundary, exactly when this mass extinction occurred. So what did the impact actually do? Well, if we look here, we can we can see this is a gravity map for the Yucatan Peninsula. So here we have the coastline of Mexico running along here. So to the south, we actually have dry land and to the north, we have the Gulf of Mexico. And what you can see is if you look at the gravity map, you can see you have these circular features associated there and you have a semicircular feature that's coming around here. And these are the faults which are associated with the formation of the crater. So these are the result of the crater forming process. And so by looking at these, we can actually work out where the edge of the crater will fall. Now, another thing that we see is because the rocks in the area got very, very heavily faulted as part of the crater making process, it means that these faults in the ground are going to be exploited by water. So you're going to get water moving underground using the fault planes as a path of least resistance. 
and so because the rocks in this area are mostly made of limestones the passage of the water along these fault plains is going to lead to the formation of caves and eventually uh, the roofs of these caves will fall in and this is going to lead to the formation of sinkholes and so if you look here we have all of these white spots on the diagram and these are all sinkholes and what you'll notice is there's a distinct band of sinkholes coming around here which is associated with this gravity high and so what you're seeing here is you're seeing essentially sinkholes forming along one of these very very large faults which was part of the crater forming process and so this is another piece of evidence that shows us that we have a crater here so we know that the impact will have occurred in a coastal region and this obviously helps to explain the presence of the mega tsunami deposits because of course if the meteorite goes into the, goes into the oceans of course that's obviously going to lead to the formation of a very very large tsunami now the ejector the material that's thrown out uh, during the impact event is obviously going to enter the atmosphere and a lot of that material is going to end up blocking out the sun now this period of time could have lasted anywhere from several months to a more recent study which suggests the sun could have been partially blocked out for anywhere in excess of 100 years so this is you know a, a uh, an interesting problem we know that the sunlight would have been blocked out by all this dust in the atmosphere one of our issues is how long it took for that dust to exit the atmosphere and for sunlight to make it back onto the surface of the earth in reasonable quantities so the loss of this sunlight obviously would have been detrimental for photosynthesizing organisms and so obviously we will have seen a lot of those photosynthesizing organisms dying off of course this is going to then cause the food chain to collapse because the these um small photosynthesizing organisms are essentially at the base of the of the food chain in the marine environment obviously because we're blocking out the sun we're also going to see a decrease in global temperatures because no sunlight is making it to the surface of the earth so that means far less solar radiation obviously as we've discussed we're going to see the onset of massive wildfires associated with the impact and this is going to lead to the destruction of large areas of forest it's also going to lead to large amounts of carbon dioxide being put into the atmosphere the other thing that we notice is that the rock which is vaporized by the impact ended up putting quite large quantities of sulfur and nitrogen into the air so it just so happens that the marine well, the marine sediments tend to be relatively rich in sulfur and so this means that when these marine sediments were vaporized as part of the impact event a lot of that sulfur went into the atmosphere and of course when you have sulfur and you mix it with water you end up forming sulfuric acid when you have nitrogen you mix it with water you can end up forming nitric acid and so this is going to lead to acid rain and of course acid rain is very very bad because depending on where it lands it can either cause the ph of soil to decrease or it could even in extreme cases cause the ph of the oceans to decrease and of course this is going to be very very bad if soil ph decreases so it becomes more acidic that can kill the roots of plants and if the ph of in, in the oceans decreases that can make it very difficult for animals that have carbonate shells to survive because the carbonate is going to be constantly reacting with the more acidic water so was was an impact the cause of the cretaceous tertiary extinction the answer is yes and then again no so one of the questions we have to ask ourselves is how come the dinosaurs died out but the crocodiles the turtles and the mammals managed to make it through there clearly have to have been other factors operating during this time period now data indicates that the dinosaurs the flying reptiles and marine reptile populations in the late cretaceous had on the whole been declining and so this would suggest that the dinosaurs were already in trouble there is however some evidence to suggest that right at the end of the cretaceous the dinosaurs might actually have been making a bit of a comeback but it looks like this cretaceous tertiary mass extinction seems to have put a stop to that 
So the change in the dinosaur populations that we see as we're moving through the Cretaceous is likely a response to the change in global and regional climates which are being produced as the continents move towards their current positions. At the same time, we're obviously going to see a change in ocean currents as well as the continents move towards their current positions, and so that's going to affect marine organisms. And so what we see is we have both populations of animals on the land and in the oceans which are already being stressed by the breakup of Pangaea and the movement of the continents towards their current locations. And then on top of that, we then obviously have this impact. So in terms of marine environments, we see that the warm shallow seas, which we had throughout much of the Mesozoic, especially in the Cretaceous, are also rapidly, de also rapidly regressing. And so this is going to mean that the habitats for animals like ammonites, rudest bivalves and marine reptiles essentially are going to be reduced. And so obviously that's going to make it more difficult for them to survive. We also still have the Deccan traps eruption going on in India. That's going to be putting in put out, putting out, should I say, sorry, huge quantities of sulfur dioxide into the atmosphere that's going to react with water to produce sulfuric acid. That's going to lead to acid rain. And we're also going to have the eruption putting out large quantities of chlorine and fluorine. That's also going to go into the atmosphere where it's going to react with ozone. So it's going to degrade the ozone layer. So what, what you essentially have is you have a situation where the dinosaurs, the flying reptiles, the marine reptiles, the ammonites, the rudists and other marine organisms are already in a pretty bad situation. And then just to top it off, you get this huge impact occurring and that pretty much finishes them off. In contrast, other groups of animals like the crocodiles, the turtles and the mammals were on the whole doing pretty well in the Cretaceous. So it looks like they were on a relatively firm footing before this impact occurred. And so that managed to help them to make it through this event and make it into the Cenozoic where they could then start diversifying. Okay, everybody. So that's it for this lecture. Thank you for watching and have a good day.